morning, everyone. Um, so I was speaking a couple Wednesdays ago, and now I'm in the pulpit on Sunday morning. I don't know how that happened, uh, but if anyone at Westside asks you to speak on a Wednesday, just know you might end up here. Um, so be careful. Um, I am so glad to be here this morning. Uh, I know 99% of y'all know me, but we have a house full of guests, and a lot of y'all might have never met me before, so I'm just going to introduce myself again. I'm Simon Everett. I'm uh, one of the apprentices at the CCSC. Um, <clears throat> my wife, uh, Bridget, is somewhere here. If you haven't met her, please meet her. She's awesome. Um, and I just love college students. And so today is really exciting, and man, I'm just so fired up. Uh, even though it's kind of gloomy outside, um, I'm, I'm ready to go. And on that note, um, even though I'm excited, I'm pretty tired. Uh, we have had a week, a whole week full of events and crazy things going on. And this next week, we've got a whole other week of events. Um, and so needless to say, I'm going to use today as a day of rest. I know a lot of times we say that uh, Sunday's our day of rest and we end up doing work and uh, not resting, but you bet the recliner will be laid back this afternoon after lunch. Um, but I'm ready for next week. I'm ready for all the, the cool events we got going on. If you have not met any of our college students, please, uh, after service, come down here and say hi, introduce yourself. Please come to our, our lunch over there at the Family Center. Anyone is welcome. We just want to welcome um, and show the, uh, the love and family that Westside is to these college students. So uh, before we get into any text today, um, I'm going to give you all a little history lesson. I know some of you all are taking out your pillows and leaning your head back when I say that. Um, I love history. My wife, not so much. Um, I'll, be, I'll be like reading something on the internet or find like an article or something. Um, and I'll be telling her like, oh, did you know so-and-so happened in whatever, you know, and she'll just be like, yeah, yeah. Like she really zones out when I start talking about history facts. Um, but I love history. I don't get to study it or learn about history enough because I'm in graduate school at Harding, and so most of my reading and learning is assigned by someone other than myself, which is unfortunate. <laughs> but I'm learning how to be a, a campus minister, and um, it's good, and God is doing good work on the tech campus. Um, but anyways, <clears throat> so there is this place in Mississippi um, some of y'all may or may not have heard of it. It's called Rodney. It's a small, small town um, about, about three quarters of the way down the, uh, the state of Mississippi, right on the river, right on the, the Louisiana border. And so, you know, it's a delta town. It's, it's right on the river. Um, Rodney, Mississippi is... It is a pretty old place. Uh, it was founded in, I think, 1828. Um, and so in just, you know, under a decade, it's gonna be a couple hundred years old. Um, also Rodney, the, the area around Rodney has been like a significant community and gathering place um, since before the Revolutionary War times. And even before that, there are artifacts that historians have found that lead them to believe uh, that the area where Rodney is at is where a, a major crossing of the Mississippi was for Native Americans. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty serious when I say like Rodney for centuries, you know, it has, has just been a significant community and place. Um, <clears throat> and in the 1800s, in the 1800s America, in the 1800s uh, Southern America, especially the River Delta, um, Rodney was the, the um, prosperous place in Mississippi for um, agriculture exports. It was just strategically located uh, in such a way that 
it was just a, an easy stopping point and a good uh, trading post. And over time, it just became this flourishing community um, and really this, this prominent port for the state of Mississippi. Um, and when you say that you know, agriculture was the driving force of the economy for the South, for America in that time, um, I guess you could say for the state of Mississippi, Rodney was the driving force of their economy. And obviously cotton was um, the cash crop and you know, sadly, plantation and slave labor was the way things were, but um, Rodney was, was the, just this flourishing place that um, there, were, there were strains of cotton that were developed in Rodney that ended up um, being pretty prominent in other places in the country. There were advancements in agriculture technology and the way things were, um, just kind of the way things were, were done as far as cotton farming. And so at, at one point in time, uh, Rodney being just this port of prosperity grew to about 4,000 people, which is not really that much, but in the, the Delta in the South in the 1800s, that's a pretty substantial town, like it's a pretty substantial community. Uh, I think I read something where they said they had two or three doctor's offices. So, um, I mean, they were getting with it. Um, but not only was Rodney a um, financial and economic powerhouse, it was a cultural influence and point of prosperity for that time. The first opera house in the state of Mississippi was in Rodney. Um, which I'm not sure if there's an, uh, an opera house in Mississippi right now. I don't know who's going to them. Some of you opera fans may be getting ready to uh, get up and leave, but I'm definitely not gonna be watching opera. Um, anyways, Rodney was known for its festivals and its, its fairs and its community life and just kind of, it was on the front edge of things that were going on if there were a lot of things going on in the River Delta in the 1800s in Mississippi. Um, Rodney at one time was three votes away from becoming the capital of Mississippi. And so um, it really was just this kind of, you know, it was almost the head of the place where the head of the government of the state was gonna be. And so it, it was really this, this, just this point of prosperity and, and flourishing. Um, kind of as a side note, there were some famous people who ended up kind of falling in love with Rodney. And, and that's one of the reasons that it kind of gained this cultural influence. Um, Zachary Taylor, who was our 12th president, he actually um, was doing some business deals in Rodney and ended up falling in love with the place, and he bought 1,900 acres, and uh, he paid, I think it was $60,000 at that time, which is a lot of money for the mid-1800s, but if you, if you kind of calculate it out, it's, uh, it's not even $2 million, um, which is a really good deal for 1,900 acres of uh, River Delta land. So, <clears throat> um, you know, like I said, it had 4,000 people. Um, it, it just kind of rose to this fame. Um, but uh, after the Civil War had happened, Rodney had, had went through some, you know, obviously some pretty close battles that were close by and had taken some tolls. Um, there were a couple cases of yellow fever that went around the city and ended up wiping out a lot of people. Um, but really, um, something major happened that, that changed the, the, the course of Rodney, uh, Mississippi forever. Um, the Mississippi River actually started moving. About 1870, it had, it had moved about three miles away from Mississippi. Uh, a big sandbar had developed, or uh, three miles away from Rodney, and a big sandbar had developed, and obviously they lost, um, they lost their port. And so today, Rodney is literally a ghost town. Um, by 1930, there were less than 100 people there. And today, there's a handful and literally like 
five people who live in Rodney. Their buildings are dilapidated. Some of the old um, Civil War era artifacts still stand. Um, if you're a ghost hunter, which I am not, <laughs> um, Rodney is a place you want to be, I guess. It's supposed to be haunted, right? And so it's, it's literally this, this deserted place, um, this ghost town. Uh, Rodney lost its connection to the river, and it dried up and died. And so it's kind of this um, idea that I'm trying to get across that with, where water is, where, where water flows, life almost always springs up. Um, here's another story, and you've heard this one before, I think. Um, so we go to Gulf Coast Getaway. Uh, we take our college group there, and it's this conference down in Florida. A lot of y'all know what I'm talking about. Conference down in Florida, like a thousand college students there. It's great and it's awesome. Uh, last year, we, well, we do a, um, a fundraiser kind of thing every year. And so last year, the fundraiser was to benefit a specific family that had been affected by the hurricane. Um, the year before that, the fundraiser um, was for an pl- a organization called Christian Relief Fund. And uh, I actually went on a mission trip with Christian Relief Fund. They're a great organization. They, uh, they basically just help kids and children in impoverished places. And one of the ways that they do that is by drilling wells in um, the Horn of Africa, which is under an extreme drought. Um, and so CRF will go in and drill a well and basically provide clean water to um, people that just you know, have to walk miles to get it or don't even ha- hardly have access at all to clean water. And so at Gulf Coast Getaway, um, that was what the, the fundraiser was for. And we raised like $16,000. Um, a bunch of college students raised that. That is awesome. And it was enough to pay for a well. I think it cost $10,000 um, for a drilling rig to go out to Africa. And so every time they drill a well, it cost $10,000. And we were able to literally drill a well and uh, with, with that money that we, uh, we raised. And what happened, and what happens almost every time that CRF drills a well is a community springs up around it. Um, Again, it's just this kind of idea that where water is, life springs up. Um, I think CRF, last year, they, they had like a promo video where we actually got to see an actual like structures and community and people that had formed around this well that we had drilled. Um, and they had planted a church and it was really awesome to see that. Uh, I don't know, I, pro- I was still in college at that time, so I probably gave like two or three bucks, but I guess you can say I helped build a city. Um, anyways, it's just this idea that where water flows, life almost always springs up, almost always flourishes. Um, another story, I was turkey hunting in Kansas, and if you know anything about Kansas, there's a lot of crop fields. And if you know anything about turkeys, they live in trees, they roost in trees. And so um, it didn't take long for me and my buddies to figure out that if we were gonna find a turkey in the flattest lands that we've ever seen, um, we were gonna have to find a creek because creeks were where trees were. Um, And so it's just this idea that, again, where water is, life springs up. And we didn't figure that out well into the trip, and uh, next time I'll be more prepared. Um, But anyways, there's just this natural law. Like, that's just a natural law, that life comes up around water. Um, We know that through history, and and we're kind of removed from that now because we have, obviously, indoor plumbing and and things like that. Um, But if you go to third world countries, again, you know, they're they're around water. but there's also a biblical principle and a, a spiritual aspect to this idea that uh, where water is, life springs up. And so we're going to look at the, the book of Ezekiel 
specifically Ezekiel chapter 47. Um, before we get into the text, I just want to um, kind of preface that uh, Ezekiel is a crazy book. Um, there's a lot of wild things that go on in it. Basically, what Ezekiel um, is, and this is um, kind of refreshing to me because not a lot of people you know, actually spend a lot of time in Ezekiel because it's such a wild and, and crazy things go on in it. Um, Ezekiel was a guy who lived during the, the Babylonian exile of the Israelites. And so um, the Babylonians came and put the city of Jerusalem under siege and they spared the city for a little while. Um, I guess they had a couple different waves of attacks. But the first wave of attack, uh, Ezekiel was taken captive and a whole group of, of his people with him were taken captive and put into exile and dragged back to Babylon. And so the book of Ezekiel um, is, is him living in Babylon as an exile. <clears throat> and what happens is he gets these visions and they're kind of crazy visions. Chapter one starts out talking about like this, um, this throne that um, is just this dazzling, awesome, powerful throne that he has a vision of, which is like sitting on a, a cart um, that, and then the cart's being held up by like winged beasts with uh, a couple different heads and all these, all these eyes. And then underneath the beasts are wheels that were moving the cart that also had tons of eyes on it. And on the throne that was on the cart was what Ezekiel calls the, the glory of the power of God. Um, and so Ezekiel was having these visions of, uh, you know, being visited by the, the glory of God. Um, another couple things that are kind of crazy about Ezekiel, uh, God commissioned Ezekiel to, to prophesy to the, the Israelites that their exile was um, because of their sins against God and that they had sinned and turned away from God. Um, and Ezekiel prophesied to them, uh, not only orally, but he did some acting. And it's kind of weird why God wanted him to like act out plays in public. Um, but some of the things God told him to do was to cut off all of his hair and chop it up with a sword in the middle of the town. Another thing God told him to do, and this is weird, uh, he was gonna be tied up and lay on his side for over a year. And the only thing he was gonna eat was bread that, as scripture puts it, bread that is cooked over human excrement. Um, and so it's, I'm not joking when I say this is a crazy book. Um, I just said human excrement in front of my grandma. She's here today, um, which I'm glad that my family's here. Um, but yeah, it's just this crazy wild book. Um, <clears throat> anyways, he's seeing these visions and that's, that's where we're at in chapter 47. Uh, it's this beautiful image of water um, and, I, and I, think it, I think it has something to say to us. So I'm just gonna jump in the text. It's kind of dense, but we're gonna uh, work through it. <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 47, verse one. Uh, the man brought me back to the entrance of the temple and I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east for the temple faced east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. He then brought me out through the north gate and led me around the outside to the outer gate facing east. And the water was trickling from the south side. As a man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits. Uh, and then he led me through water that was ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits and led me through water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through water that was up to the waist. He measured off another thousand still, but now it was a river that I could not cross uh, because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in, a river that no one could cross. He asked me, son of man, do you see this? Then he led me back to the bank, and when I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side. He said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah, where it enters the Dead Sea. When it empties into the sea, the salty water there becomes fresh, 
and swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish because the water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. And so where the river flows, everything will live. Fishermen will stand along the shore from the En Gedi to the En Eglum, and there will be places for spreading their nets. The fish will be of many kind, like the fish of the Mediterranean. But the swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear fruit, because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food, and their leaves for healing. <clears throat> um, and so for Ezekiel, this, this was just this beautiful image that there was hope in this exile. Um, you know, he had been cast away from his people and from the uh, Jerusalem had been destroyed and the temple destroyed. And um, for Ezekiel, it, you just get this sense that God is trying to tell him that he hasn't left them, right? That, that there is a way that, that he has always had in plan that leads back to this perfect uh, creation and this perfect relationship reconciles the cosmos back to the way they were supposed to be, you know, life-giving. Um, for Ezekiel, you know, this had to be, be uh, crazy joyous to, to get this picture of this river of life that flows from the presence of God. And so uh, there's a couple things I want you to notice from this passage that I think is important to us. Um, number one, the river starts... The, uh, the, the trickle starts at the foundation of the temple. Um, and the temple was where the, the, uh, the glory of God dwelt. It was the, the presence of God in the most holy of holies. And so this river of life starts from the creator of the universe. Uh, also, Ezekiel, he kept waiting, um, W-A-D, waiting, uh, he kept wading deeper. You know, he was ankle deep and then knee deep. And finally, you know, it was just a river that, that could not be crossed um, without swimming. So Ezekiel kept wading. Um, and also something that, that needs to be said about this passage is it's, it's so uh, metaphorical for us that it flows into the Dead Sea <clears throat> he says in verse 8, he said, uh, this water flows toward the eastern region where it enters the Dead Sea. And so if you don't know anything about the Dead Sea, it's the lowest um, place on the surface of the earth, you know, that isn't covered in an ocean. Um, so the Dead Sea is full of salt, and um, it's, you know, so many times saltier than the ocean, and no life can live there, no fish Nothing can live there. If you look at pictures of the Dead Sea, it's, it's fairly desolate. And so it's really this, this image that from the source of God, from the presence of the Lord, from the, the, the creator of the universe, flows this river of life that, that, that restores some of the most desolate places to the way things are supposed to be, to life-giving And so I want to say this, um, that you may, be, you may be ankle deep where you are right now. You may be ankle deep in your life, just getting started with your family or your job or what God, what, what God has called you to do or where you're supposed to go with your life. You may be ankle deep in your school, um, but as long as we go deeper in the river of life that flows from the presence of God, as long as you keep wading deeper, you will find life and you will find a perfect relationship with the creator of the universe. Um, also, wherever we're at, wherever you're at, it, it may be some of the most desolate seeming places, it may be um, some of the most lifeless 
time in your life, some of the most um, depressed and hard and tough time in your life, but wherever you're at, just know that from the source of God, from the presence of, of the creator of the universe flows a river of life that restores things back to the way they were supposed to be. And so, <clears throat> church, we have got to own this. Like if, you, if, like if you are here right now and you're wading deeper and you're already at the banks of this fruitful river and you're already in deep with God, you've got to own this. You've got to know that the deeper you go, the better it gets. You've got to know that. And we have to be the ones drilling the wells to give people access points to this river of life that flows from the presence of God. We have to be the ones that are bringing people and getting their feet wet in this river of life. And college students, um, specifically, you might feel like you're only ankle deep right now. You might even feel like your toes are, are hardly you know, lapping the water. Um, but you've got to know that the deeper you go, the better it gets. The deeper you go, the more you keep waiting, as long as you stay connected to the river of life that flows from the presence of God, the better it gets. And so you think about Rodney, Mississippi, who lost his connection with the river and dried up. But as long as you stay connected, as long as you stay near the banks of the river, as long as you stay wading deeper into the presence of God, the better it gets. And that all happens with the church. That all happens with a faith community. And so I beg you, I beg you to keep going deeper, keep wading farther, keep searching for, for that life-giving um, deep ocean of the river of life that flows from the creator of the universe. And really, we know that this points right to Jesus. It's got to. I, I love what um, Jesus says in John chapter four. He says, in verse 14, he says, the water that I give will become a spring of water that wells up to eternal life. You know, Ezekiel has this vision of the river of life. You're making the most desolate places um, spring up with life, full of life. That only can happen through Jesus Christ. That can only happen. And so I beg you, if you're ankle deep right now, I beg you, I, I, I implore you, the deeper you go, keep waiting. The deeper you go, the better it's going to get. And I hope this image sticks with you. I hope this passage sticks with you. As a freshman um, in our Sunday morning Bible class out here at Westside, as a freshman, my first, I think it was welcome worship, my first Sunday here, I heard this message, and it has... Um, urged me to keep going deeper throughout my journey of life. And so if you're here today and you feel like um, you've got to go deeper, we want to we wanna offer opportunities for you to do that. Um, if you feel like you're, you're being called to come um, be in a relationship with God and Jesus through baptism, we want to do that today. If you just need prayers to go deeper, if you need the church to pray around you um, that you would just keep pushing forward towards the river of life. We want to do that as well. There will be um, guys stationed around the auditorium, around the room. We have a prayer room here in the back that you can go to. Um, and so all of your prayers will be confidential unless you say so. Um, but I just want to leave you with this. Do not forget it. The deeper you go, the better it's going to get. So let's stand and sing. Thank you.